Okay, so we're super excited to have Cass as our speaker. I realize he doesn't really require an introduction given um, that this is a crowd of folks who knows about behavioral science, but I'm gonna give him a short one anyway, way, uh, because it feels appropriate. So Cass is currently the Robert Walmsley University Professor at Harvard. He's the founder and director of the Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy at Harvard Law School. And in 2018, he received the Holberg Prize from the government of Norway, which is sometimes described is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for the Law and Humanities. He has so many other accolades that if I read them, we actually would keep going until his time was up. So I'm going to cede the floor to Cass and let him uh, tell you wonderful things about what he's been thinking about, what he's been studying, and then we'll come back for conversation later. Thank you so much for joining us, Cass. Thank you for being our closer. We're so excited and we'll, we'll go away and let you take over. Okay, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Angela. I'm completely thrilled uh, to be discussing what I'm about to discuss with this amazing group. Um, and it, first and foremost, it's because of the amazing group, but second, it's because of the topic. So I'm going to be discussing something concrete and something a little more abstract. The concrete thing is fuel economy rules, which you can think of as a sibling to energy efficiency rules, which is applied behavioral science in practice on the front burner in the United States, meaning the proper analysis of fuel economy rules is something that the Biden administration is going to have to uh, attempt uh, sooner rather than later. If we're thinking of an example in the real world of the most important policy use of behavioral science, there is a strong claim that we're right there, that fuel economy regulation, which is not typically analyzed by the median behavioral science theorist or practitioner as an example of behavioral science in practice, it is exactly that in terms of the massive consequences for uh, approximately zillions of people, uh, fuel economy rules are a candidate for the most important uh, exa example. Uh, we are not speaking of a nudge, we are speaking of a mandate. The relevant data that is supposedly justifying the mandate is highly disputed. Where the main location of the dispute resides is in the question whether we have internalities that are significant or not. That issue, which the Biden administration is going to have to come to terms with, uh, has empirical uh, data which cuts in ambiguous and multiple directions. I'll get to that in a moment. To get a purchase on the problem, the relatively secret fact, secret not in the, fa in the sense that it's hidden or anything, but in the sense that people don't see it, is that consumer savings dominate the analysis of the benefits of fuel economy rules, not greenhouse gas reductions, not uh, particulate mass matter reductions. The dominant source of benefits, and I'm going to give some numbers shortly, is uh, internalities, that is consumer savings. Okay, that's the specific issue we're going to engage. To get at it, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about abstractions. And what the paper is uh, about is Hayekian behavioral economics. This is intended to generate a kind of uh, framework or theme for uh, behavioral economics uh, in the 21st century. And it's Hayekian, not in the sense that it's in love with free markets necessarily, but in the sense that it uh, uh, respects uh, two aspects of Hayek's thought. One is skepticism about planners on the ground that planners, even the best motivated, have epistemic gaps. They don't know as much as dispersed people do frequently. So Hayek's plea for markets as opposed to planners is about the knowledge problem as it's currently described facing planners. Hayek actually had, in addition to that skepticism about planners, a second theme which he hammered on with less um, aggression than John Stuart Mill, which is about the uh, advantage of choosers over outsiders. So the second lighter claim is that choosers have, you typically know a lot better than outsiders about what would promote their welfare. 
Okay, it's familiar to say that the second Hayekian theme about the epistemic advantage of choosers has taken uh, some empirical, uh, uh, taken on some empirical water in the last uh, generation and more. And the question is whether it's possible to acknowledge the knowledge problem and to think about how to do behavioral welfare economics while also acknowledging the existence of uh, information gaps and behavioral biases. So the neo-Hayekian approach seeks to reduce the knowledge problem by asking what individual choosers would do under epistemically favorable conditions. So that's the basic goal. And the question is, can we discipline that goal, that project in a way that converts big theoretical debates into tractable empirical questions. And here the idea is there's an empirical project that many people have been engaging in, which has uh, a neo-Hayekian flavor in the sense that it asks just five questions, which are tractable questions. The first is what do consistent choosers unaffected by self-evidently irrelevant factors end up choosing? Uh, Jacob Golden at Stanford has done this, asked this question as a question in the savings context. And that question can give us some traction on how to proceed with behavioral welfare economics in the face of framing effects. A second question would be asked, what do informed choosers choose? That would overcome just an informational barrier. A third question would ask, what do active choosers choose? So if inert choosers end up in one circumstance or another circumstance, we might not think that that tells us ter terribly much, but active choosers would tell us something more because they're not inert. The interest in active choosing or prompted choice as opposed to default rules has a Hayekian flavor in the sense that it is deferential to choosers under circumstances in which choosers are choosing. The fourth question is, when people are free of behavioral biases, including, let's say, present bias or unrealistic optimism, what do they choose? That's a bit more aggressive than asking just about active choosers. We might be able to overcome present bias or unrealistic optimism, or at least dent them, by throwing uh, the future in people's faces. And that could give, make salient or relevant something that people might otherwise disregard. The fifth point and the final point is to ask what do people choose when the view screen is broad and when they don't suffer from limited attention. So the basic idea would be that if certain features of situations are typically not salient or people don't attend to them, uh, what do people choose when those features are made salient or when they do attend to them? It might be whether we're speaking about diet or exercise or soda consumption or fuel economy or energy efficiency or road safety that we could get traction on each of the five questions. And if we know what consistent, informed, active, behaviorally unbiased choosers who don't suffer from limited attention do, we know something about the right policy intervention in a way that partakes of that part of the liberal tradition associated with Hayek and Mill, which is deferential to the diversity of utility functions that human beings have, and that responds, it is to be hoped, to the concerns about skeptics of behaviorally informed policy, that it is insufficiently attentive to the preferences and values of choosers. Okay. The theoretical suggestion is there's uh, an idea here which is connected in some ways with um, empirical projects underway and connected in some ways with theoretical work which we can see in behavioral welf welfare economics and that is a potentially fruitful project. Now let's do it. Let's implement the project, shall we, in the context of fuel economy. Okay, the standard economic view is for fuel economy, what you want is to provide people with information so they can choose vehicles that are uh, preferred by them, given what they care about. And insofar as we're dealing with externalities, we should have a uh, corrective tax. And that's a simple program for policy 
and it is uh, respectful both of individual choice and of the need to correct for externalities. The behavioral hunch is that that might not work if consumers stand to gain a great deal from fuel efficient cars and if the tax won't get you that, and if information will be challenging to provide in a way that overcomes behavioral biases. So the behavioral hunch, and let's call it the provocative behavioral claim, is that contrary to the standard economic prescription, if what you want is to maximize net benefits, a fuel economy rule might do better than a corrective tax because it might both correct the externality though in a way that's admittedly less efficient than a corrective tax, but also give you massive benefits in terms of consumer savings and a corrective tax can't give that. It can only correct the externality. So the suggestion is in principle, the, uh, the disfavored intervention that is a fuel economy rule could be much better than the standard favored one. The US government has uh, embraced under President Obama, the behavioral hunch, saying that consumers don't purchase products that are, are in their interest and saying in a way that would make the Hayekian nervous and maybe break out in hives, that consumers might be myopic and so undervalue the long-term. Uh, they might not have a full appreciation of information even when it's prevented, presented. They might be loss averse. I think the claim here has to be myopic loss aversion. So the myopia point has to be wedded to the loss aversion point. And there might be a problem of lack of salience. So the US government said under the Obama administration, there's an assortment, I think a trilogy of behavioral problems, which suggests that a regulatory mandate can be in consumers' interests. And that was the theoretical prop for the claim that there are consumer savings in terms of money of $529 billion. Pause over that. We're not talking about the modest one or 2% increase that some nudges typically have generating, let's say, tens of millions of dollars in net benefits. That's good. But we're talking now of $529 billion. And you need a number like that to make a second number, 15 billion, look low. The $15 billion figure is the time savings for consumers which the government says are real and not taken on board ex anti by, by consumers, which suggests I was an English major, not a math major in college. But by my calculation, this took a long time. That means we have $544 billion in benefits from consumer savings plus time savings. The externality savings are in the vicinity of 60 or $70 billion, maybe a bit north of that. Um, those are significant, but they are dwarfed by the benefit that's not supposed to count. That is the consumer savings in terms of economics and time. Uh, to put a number on it, 86% of the benefits of fuel economy rules are by the government's own calculations, a product of internality benefits which means that a paltry 14% come from externality savings, which is to suggest that if we didn't have the consumer savings, the fuel efficiency rule in the United States would be much too aggressive. It should be much less stringent. Okay, the Hayekian evaluation of what the Obama administration did, I think is approximately here right now. Looking at active choosers, there are about five question marks next to the Obama administration's analysis, not an X, but five question marks, because the most recent generation of studies looking not at planner calculation, but at consumer behavior, finds that a significant chunk of the present value of lifetime fuel savings of vehicles with higher fuel economy appears to be reflected in the price of new and used vehicles. And changes in gas prices lead consumers to adjust their purchasing decisions, suggesting that in choosing among vehicles, 
consumers are highly attentive to fuel economy. So let's just take that as a bullet point for a series of empirical studies suggestive that in fact, consumers are attentive to fuel economy and this stuff about myopic loss aversion and a lack of salience actually might not be true in terms of what consumers are actually doing. And the Trump administration took that material on board in doubting the, the force of the behavioral justification for what the Obama administration did. Not only do we have that, studies of consumer choice under market conditions, a field experiment, a very impressive field experiment by Hunt Alcott and co-author finds that if you try really hard to overcome a lack of salience and a lack of information on the part of consumers by throwing in their face material about fuel economy before they make purchases, this is both in person at Ford dealerships and online. Online, basically you don't get a significant difference in actual purchasing decisions, which suggests if we use our Hayekian framework and ask what informed consumers whose behavioral biases, at least we try to overcome, what happens, we don't get a different choice, which is suggestive now that there's a heavy burden of justification on those who believe that there is a behavioral bias, which is leading consumers to make choices that are not in their self-interest. And I want to say here that you can understand the research I've just done to be kind of cautiously supportive of informational interventions, but also suggestive that you might not even need them because consumers might be making the right choice anyhow. On the other hand, there's evidence cutting the other way. A committee of the National Research Council surveyed practitioners in the industry and concluded that auto manu manufacturers don't think typical consumers are gonna pay up front for the full life of the vehicle. Their belief is that consumers are gonna pay up front for only one to four years. Now that's a belief, it's a belief by people who are informed, it's only suggestive. Also suggestive is household surveys, which suggest motorists aren't making present value calculations about fuel savings and don't make use of expert services that could help them evaluate their fuel economy investments. That's also suggestive only, but it's a question mark, at least next to the five question marks. Now we're gonna put a bunch of question marks next to the question marks which is a long-winded way of saying, now we're going to try to vindicate the Obama-Biden thought that there really is a problem. About Bafflingly, a large-scale study of behavior finds that after a significant correction of an erroneously stated miles per gallon measure by a large uh, company, I think it was Nissan, consumers, forgive me, Nissan, if I've just libeled you, it was a company that sells a lot of cars, they made a mistake. Once it was corrected, consumers were unresponsive. The study finds that consumers acted highly myopically. They were indifferent between a dollar in discounted fuel costs and 15 to 38 cents in the vehicle purchase plate price, which is suggestive that the original speculation from the EPA and the Department of Transportation is supported by the suggestion that once consumers get clarity about what miles per gallon are, is, meaning less good than that had previously been stated, they didn't change their behavior. A recent study finds if you do a pairwise comparison about a bunch of vehicles where there's a hybrid or a gasoline version of the same vehicle, across a number of consumers who ought to be choosing the hybrid on the ground that it's better given what they care about. It's extremely hard to find out why they're choosing the gasoline version. So that in a significant chunk of cases, you can't generate a rational explanation for why they're choosing the non-hybrid vehicle even when you consider non-pecuniary attributes such as performance and cargo space. So that creates a big puzzle why people aren't buying the hybrid. 
there's a crisp argument by people who work on consumer behavior, suggesting that consumers are familiar with changes in fuel price. That's true, but changes in technology are less familiar. And we're suggesting, we're finding consumer uh, reluctance to purchase vehicles at a premium price that are equipped with unfamiliar technological features, even when they're in consumers' interests. I'm almost done. I want to underline just three final points. The government's numbers, which find no significant consumer welfare loss from for fuel economy standards after exhaustive work trying to find one, that's consistent with the suggestion that consumers are in fact suffering from a behavioral bias. That is, if you found that people were buying smaller cars or uh, were buying smaller cars than they otherwise wanted because of the regulation, they're getting littler cars or more dangerous cars or cars that don't accelerate as well, then the rational account would work. But the government's numbers are not finding that even under President Trump. Second point is that we have a little bit of a framework here that is providing traction in terms of the proper analysis under the Hayekian cautionary notes or more about epistemic disadvantages that planners face and epistemic advantages that choosers have. The Hayekian framework is denting the claim of a behavioral bias, but there's a lot that we don't know. An imaginable path forward, this is my final point, for government is to say, what are our option sets? One would be to say, as the Trump administration has been inclined to, that these alleged consumer savings are actually eaten up by some consumer loss that we can't identify, but that must exist given the data out there about responsiveness to uh, gas prices increasing or decreasing and about unresponsiveness to information provision, even when it's salient. So to say these consumer savings are mirage, don't look at it anymore. That would be one path. The second would be to say, as the Obama administration did, that they're just real and that the planner analysis of what consumers are getting demonstrates that they're real. A third approach, which I think is looking pretty good, is to do sensitive and sensitivity analysis on different plausible assumptions about consumer behavior. So say, given one assumption of lots of consumer error, error how is look, this looking on cost-benefit grounds? Another assumption on moderate consumer error, how is this looking on cost-benefit grounds? Another assumption on modest or trivial consumer error, how is it looking? That would probably be uh, a plausible way to go. It would be extravagant to say that asking the questions to which I appointed pointed, uh, would uh, make for a un unmistakably Hayekian approach given Hayek's grave concern about uh, planner um, uh, error. But it's not extravagant to say that the five questions are in Hayek's and I think Mill's general spir spirit and respectful of the most fundamental concerns of those who founded modern welfare economics from the philosophical point of view. And to say also that wherever we end up on fuel economy, they should be our concerns as well. Done. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Cass. Um, I, I need to ask uh, like a, a, a question that only somebody who doesn't drive, I haven't driven since the creation of Uber. So I can't count how many years that is. Um, can you give me an example of a, a current fuel economy rule? Like I was Googling it while you were talking, but maybe you can make it more real for me. So, so um, uh, forgive me if this was obscure. So in the United States, uh, it's required that the fleet meet certain fuel economy standards, meaning that if Ford sells cars, which are all fuel inefficient, it can't do that. That would violate the law. It has to have a certain level of ambition with respect to its cars. And that's true for Toyota too. And it's true for General Motors. Under President Obama, the fleet had to meet a fuel economy standard 
that would get us over 50 miles per gallon. That would be the average roughly by 2025. And Trump said, no, basically under Trump, it has to be north of 30. And the uh, Biden administration has committed to being more aggressive than Trump. I think the commitment is to be uh, basically where Obama was or possibly more. And since 2025 is coming up in a hurry, there have to be decisions made about that quickly. For those who aren't in the United States, this is an issue that all nations face. So Europe faces a question about how aggressive to be with respect to fuel economy. You could do it through regulation. You could do it through taxes of various kinds. My impression is that in Europe, uh, the cost benefit analysis, which would look at the internalities and whether they count, has not been as, choose your pick, rigorous or agonized as in the United States. And it should be rigorous and agonized because the benefits in terms of greenhouse gas emissions reductions will not get you the level of aggressiveness we've observed. Is, is that clear? Yeah, that's incredibly clear. And um, I'm gonna set up a question from uh, Eamon Colvin with a complimentary question, or just, I think I'm on the same wavelength. So I, I think if I'm right and you tell me, uh, that what makes this kind of radical to be listening to is that you are as famous as anyone probably for championing soft paternalism um, over hard paternalism and the preservation of individual choice while also making welfare go up for the individual and for society. So in this case, you say like, let's not incentivize, let's not like, like you know, no discussion of choice architecture, like just it's a mandate. So um, if I have that right, and please correct me, Eamon's question, um, I'll just read uh, verbatim, um, that this topic showcases how behavioral interventions interact with legislation. I would guess that the audience here is more familiar with behavioral interventions than using legislation as a behavioral change tool. Any guidance on when policy change ought to take precedent over non-legislative uh, behavior change? And I do think that's a hard versus soft paternalism question okay, if I have it right. Okay, so let's do a little bit on the semantics, shall we? So legislation is what's enacted by legislatures. That's not a provocative statement. Um, dogs are canines. I'm following um, you. Yeah, this is good. So this is about my level too. Legislation could say that every car has to have a fuel economy label that says something about greenhouse gas emissions. That would be a nudge through legislation. It would be light touch. Um, behavioral interventions are typically, I think, legislated or authorized by legislation. And I think the word typically is soft. So long as we're dealing with government, it's too weak. Behavioral interventions from governments are always legislated, I think. But you get, but you get Eamon's point, but right? Yeah. Yes, completely. So that's sem semantics. Um, it, it, so Eamon's completely right in drawing the distinction. So thank you, Eamon. Um, you could want a, a, a light touch or a nudge intervention if you think that that would provide the highest net benefits. And that might be because there's heterogeneity in the population or there's no externalities. So if you're talking about, let's say, um, people's consumption choices with respect to food, you might say across a wide domain, you aren't going to impose mandates or prohibitions because if people want potato chips and fudge, they are masters of their utility function. And this is a Hayekian point. Um, and, and that's all you want, but they might not know something about the adverse health effects of potato chips and brownies. I hope as a fan particularly of the latter that this is not an uninformed statement. Their health effects are not so bad, but still they are high calories, so provide calorie labels. That's a way of making, uh, 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 helping inform choice, increasing salience, and if it's designed right, it will have positive welfare effects. Um, to ban potato chips and fudge probably wouldn't be a very good idea on welfare grounds. Um, if we ha so that's one category. Another category is externalities where you wouldn't rest content with a nudge in all probability, but you might want to accompany a prohibition, let's say on uh, 
assault with nudges that are architectural interventions that reduce the incidence of assault or nudging. And so you have both. Now, what we're talking about here, fuel economy rules are standardly by economists explored in the second way that there's an externality, what are we gonna do about it? And the preferred approach is a corrective tax and a fuel economy road, rule approach would be uh, a crude second best to be justified by maximizing net benefits by reference to externality correction. In Europe and the United States, that would result in much softer, weaker fuel efficiency rules than we have. What I'm exploring here is the possibility of justifying mandates by reference to behavioral biases, uh, lack of salience, loss aversion, uh, myopia. And this has to be the justification for the fuel economy rules we observe. Uh, Thaler and I, who like nudges, uh, aren't dogmatic about it. Um, welfare is the goal. And if you have a, a mandate that people wear seat belts or helmets while, uh, while um, uh, driving motorcycles, there wouldn't be a theological objection to that. There'd be a burden of justification in terms of the welfare effects. And uh, there we go. And that's the track we're now on. The Hayekian would be very nervous. So would John Stuart Mill. So we're talking about issues in political philosophy as well as in behavioral science. Uh, the neo-Hayekian questions I'm asking, what would people choose under conditions in which they're informed and unbiased and in which they're active? Uh, that's a way of breaking a war between the hardcore anti-paternalists, let's say, and the, um, and the happy uh, advocates of behaviorally informed mandates. They can have a productive conversation now. Um, I'm gonna uh, uh, paraphrase a, a question. Well, Chris Chabri, um, who's a BCFG uh, scientist, um, uh, articulated a question which a, a few other people also um, raised. So I'll read Chris's. Um, is the otherwise irrational choice of non-hybrid or less efficient cars possibly associated with identity or political affiliation motives? For example, I'm not the kind of person who buys cars that, that get good gas mileage. Um, and as I said, there were a few other people who had um, a similar question. Could be. So there's a hypothesis there that could be tested. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to call it irrational. So Thaler and I and Kahneman avoid that word, uh, uh, might ca would call it boundedly rational or a response to a lack of salience or something or a heuristic, which is that uh, new technologies don't work maybe. Uh, my hunch, which is just a hunch, is that that would be, uh, well, I'm gonna make it a very cautious hunch, that the speculation over 1% of the relevant population not choosing the hybrid when it's in their economic percentage can be understood in the terms just described, but less than 99%. So it's, it's some group, it would be nice to know how many. It would be. Okay, here's a question from Kevin Volpe. Um, Cass, is there, probably Cass High um, from mm -hmm. Kevin, is there an argument here in terms of negative externalities in terms of greenhouse gas emissions justifying stronger efforts, for example, in Europe, there have been taxes based on the displacement of engines. How big do you estimate the effect would be of the most effective mileage labeling strategy versus taxing uh, less fuel efficient cars, um, where you could use the revenue to subsidize the purchase of more fuel efficient cars? Okay, uh, good, thank you. And hi, Kevin, you were one of my heroes. So good to be in contact with you. Um, uh, Okay, so to know what the externality is, we need to know the social cost of carbon. So if there's a ton of carbon emissions, the economic cost of that for, for the world is above zero and less than infinity. Um, the Obama administration's approach, which Canada and other nations have adopted or seriously considered, has it around $50 per ton. Um, some people believe that's too low. 
Uh, last I checked, William Nordhaus, who's probably the best in the business on this, thinks it's a bit too high, but ballpark. Now, if we think that that's the social cost of carbon, then we can build a fuel economy standard in terms of stringency based on that number. And the Trump administration number for reasons that I think aren't that interesting for present purposes is around three or $4 as opposed to 50. And that would justify a lower level of stringency. Let's suppose just for purposes of analysis, we think the Obama Biden number is right. Then the fuel economy standard we'd get would be more aggressive than the Trump administration standard we'd get, but it would be so much less aggressive than what we're observing in developed nations. You see, I hope, Kevin, you see that, that 86% of the benefit comes from something that has nothing to do with externalities. So it would be a, a very weak fuel economy standard compared to what we generally observe. Now, maybe that's the right fuel economy standard, the weak one. The behavioral uh, uh, objection is consumers are saving a lot of money with these cars. You're not counting that? The neoclassical response is uh, something like H-E-L-L, -L, no, we're not counting that because it shouldn't count. And then the behavioral response is look at the data about how responsive people are to a different label. Not, which suggests they are uh, not taking on board their economic savings. And I hope, Kevin, you're thinking in the medical context, we have analogies where the question is what the right behavioral intervention is, whether it's soft or strong, is, is now in play. Uh, the economy, we don't have a lot on the magnitude of the effect, probably in, in correcting the externality. Um, and there are current questions, I think, related to vaccines and, and masks, which would, you know, we, we, maybe we'll have time to talk about those as well. I think they're related. Um, from Amit Kumar, the mantra espoused so effectively by you and Thaler for behavior change has been, make it easy. I'm curious about how your thoughts about the largely informational policy interventions you're discussing would compare in effectiveness to something like using federal or state resources to put electric charging stations next to handicap spots, for example, uh, in many more parking lots across the country, thus making it easier to, you know, to have a more fuel efficient car. No, completely. So uh, uh, you're right that we might think that a big part of the approach to handling uh, the electric car issue is to simplify people's choices. Notice, however, that that returns us to the welfare question. What are the costs of putting these changes in 10 places, 1,000 places, 100 million places, and what are the benefits? And if we're speaking only in externalities terms, we know how to answer that question. So I hope my excitement about this is, uh, doesn't seem just idiosyncratic, that this is where the theoretical questions about behavioral science and the practical questions and really large impact all meet. So if we're only talking in terms of externalities, the analysis of the optimal level of charging stations is radically different from how, how we think about that if we're thinking about consumer savings also. Um, the placing of time as part of the welfare assessment, time savings for consumers, I think that was novel, but done by the Environmental Protection Agency of the Department of Transportation. There's no data suggesting it's wrong. Uh, and it, that seems, I think, less insecure than the claim that the consumer savings don't count. My own view is the consumer savings have not been blown out of the water by any means, but question marks have been raised about it. Not the time savings, but the time savings, while significant, $15 billion, they are a quite small fraction of the total savings. They, they're not ridiculously small compared to the greenhouse gas savings. So if you're with me, the standard, let's say, intuitive environmentalist approach 
is put the charging stations everywhere. That's a really good idea. The cautionary note is how many? And you can't answer that question without answering the question, which is our question in chief today. Um, Leonard Ladies, Apologies for mispronunciation, probably there. Uh, thank you, Cass, for this brilliant talk. Is there a partisan divide now in the United States regarding behavioral economic insights? You described a libertarian paternalism as a third nonpartisan approach before. Okay, so insofar as we're talking about nudging or libertarian paternalism, there isn't a partisan divide or it's tiny. So the Trump administration reaffirmed the calorie label rule that the Obama administration did without any visible grumpiness. It reaffirmed the nutrition facts panel without any grumpiness. Uh, with respect to savings policy and automatic enrollment, there's no change. So if you administration's thinking of the Obama administration's initiative, there's liberalism as such. Might be in particular car uh, would be enthusiasm, let's say, on the part of, uh, did I lose you for a second? Uh, there, there might be enthusiasm bec because of the policy, but not because of the I, I tried to be as clear as I was, and I'm afraid the internet made for a lack of clarity. Actually, I was hopelessly obscure and the internet saved me. But basically the answer is with respect to libertarian paternalism, that's not splitting people along political lines. Well, maybe that is a good uh, time to um, uh, end this conversation. I mean, gosh, if we could actually have um, nonpartisan slash bipartisan um, agreement on anything. So we'll end on that high note. Um, Katie's back to, to say thank you. I also wanna make sure that um, Cass, you also know that um, you and everyone else are warmly welcome to uh, resume this uh, webinar. Thank you for being a terrific peak end for us um, uh, and ending on a high note. Um, our new series will begin January 25th. I do want to tell everyone, including you, Cass, that the Zoom link will change. So you have to register anew um, in the new year, but the new year is a fresh start. So make sure that you do that. Um, Katie, anything you want to say to Cass other than um, this has been truly amazing. I, I'm, I'm so glad we got to peer into the mind of like what's going on now, because you wouldn't know this, I think, from just reading Nudge and, and earlier work. Yeah, no, this has been fantastic. Actually, I will just make a minor correction. I believe you don't actually have to register again. You'll get our emails still, but you will get a new Zoom link and we'll send information about that to your email address that where you've been getting everything. So anyway, we'll see you in January. Cass, this was wonderful. Thanks for all the work you do to bring behavioral science to a broad, um, a broad audience and to have such a huge impact on policy by using it. We're really grateful and it was wonderful to see you. Thanks Thank you, to you, Katie, uh, my friends, Katie and Angela, and thanks to everyone who's online. Thanks, Cass. See you soon. Bye-bye.